Welcome to another episode of the Unbound Book Babes. This week we are going to talk about Sarah J. Mass and her possible inspiration for her long plot of her series. So yeah, more than one. Because if you're here right now, you likely are part of the fandom and know um, that she is planning to join all of her series. There will be probably Throne of Glass, Akatar, and Crescent City spoilers. So if you have not completed your your read through of all of those items, please tread with caution um, or just come back after you're done. Okay? Because I don't want to ruin anything for you because I really I appreciate having an organic experience and I want other readers to have that same opportunity. So as we know. At the end of book two in the Crescent City series, Bryce Quinlan ends up in Perinthian. And the last true sentence is, hello, my name is Resand, right? So we know she's met the inner circle. But what we want to talk about today is something we have not heard of at all and it is a conspiracy theory plot so Kristen can you tell us a little bit more about this topic and how we ended up here today <laughs> well I mean I have no idea how we ended up here I just like blacked out for a couple of years and here I am but um <laughs> same Floating, <laughs> floating around all of like social media and TikTok um, and all, all the other SJM podcasts is everybody talking about her stories in relationship to Greek mythology, Norse mythology, Celtic mythology. Um, however, in Crescent City, I got a very different vibe out of off of where she may have been pulling some of this inspiration from. And I was like, is Sarah J. Mass a conspiracy theorist? Has she gone down the rabbit hole? And so I brought this up to Bobby after I finished Crescent City 2, and I was like, yo, the An the Asteri remind me of the Anunnaki. And I expected Bobby to be like, that's a little ridiculous, Kristen, sit down. And she went, oh, yes, absolutely. And then I was like, oh, I didn't. I didn't know anybody else had gone down that rabbit hole. So here we are going back down the rabbit hole of the Anunnaki. Yeah. After a week in heavy research that involved very little reading, I need to go touch grass. <laughs> yeah. So when you, so like it was probably two to three years ago that I stumbled across the Anunnaki and the theories behind like colonization of earth by the anunnaki and the in the uh sumerians so when kristen mentioned this i was like oh my gosh somebody else knows about the anunnaki <laughs> like so we both had that moment where it's like you know yeah uh, you know and it's like yeah so it's in this like, you have to go touch grass because this, I need everybody to put on your little tinfoil hats. I do. I need you to. And I promise you, when Chris and I first started talking about this, in all my ideas, I started spiraling. I was like, oh my gosh, this fits so good. And going back to what Kristen mentioned about um, the inspiration of ancient, you know, greek and celtic mythology i sent a a map to kristen because we in crescent city we only get a map of lunathian in charlie's book rex and plush prose and underscore with felicity recently posted Midgard, a map of Midgard, not just Crescent City and Crescent and, or Lunathian. Lunathian is a city on the planet of Midgard. So, and a lot of people were like, 
say it's like New Orleans or uh, New York City or whatever, because we know that Perithian looks very much like um, England, Scotland, and in Ireland, right? So they they used and they took i can't even imagine how much time they put into this map you guys but they used actual distances and they mapped out in midgard and i'll I'll post a link in the description to this to this uh ig post of theirs because it's beautiful and it deserves all of the attention um for all the effort they put into it but they talk about where Oh my gosh, you're never going to see it. So I'll insert a picture here. <laughs> but it's, it's aging. Everybody gather close, uh, gather really close around. Bobby's going to pass her phone around. Don't swipe on the pictures. Just look at the one. <laughs> it, it's on IG. It's on my saved IG. So there, yeah, there's, there's only screenshots of pictures of books on my phone. So you're not going to see anything. <laughs> We'll put up a teaser of what this post is. And if you want more information, you'll have to go see their actual post. Yes, exactly. But it is, it shows like Croatia and Greece and uh, Italy and all of that in this. And it lays out where everything is. And it is so crazy good. And I'm going to come back to that after we dive into a little bit of perspective about who the Anunnaki are. Yes. So, Bobby, we've teased about the Anunnaki. So, a little bit of background because we both have gone down the rabbit hole. I don't know in my day-to-day life. I don't meet a lot of people that know about the Anunnaki. Um, Maybe they've heard the term. Um, And I think some of them think it's that pasta that you roll on a fork. Uh, that's not <laughs> sounds so good right now. <laughs> um, so first and foremost, everything that we know about the Anunnaki comes from the Sumerians and their cuneiform tablets. Uh, so if you don't know what a cuneiform tablet is, it is a clay block, and as it's drying, people take tensils, tensils, utensils, a wooden stick, and stab and like make impressions on it for writing. Um, so if you thought your 10,000 page essay with a pencil was tough, um, <laughs> but so these are 5,000 years old or so. I don't know if that number is exactly right, but they're freaking old. Uh, but it's a lost language. So there's been a lot of translations and there is a lot of debate around the translations of these cuneiform tablets. Um, I selfishly just pick the ones that most apply to Crescent City, um, and that's what we're running with. And if you have a problem with that, um, I mean, fight yourself. I don't care. (laughs) I'm trying to remember the, the name of the guy who introduced me to the Sumerians. Like, personally? Uh, No. (laughs) <laughs> the topic of the Sumerians. So, little known fun fact, I think Bobby knows this. In 2019, I actually went to Contact in the Desert with my dad and my mom. And we got to see a live panel. Oh my god, I'm going to absolutely butcher these names. It's two of the guys off Ancient Aliens. Well, it's actually several of them. I think there's um, Giorgio. God, I'm going to absolutely butcher. I already have. <laughs> And it written down. Oh my god. Giorgio, Giorgio So Calves. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> you know what? He's literally the uh poster guy for this episode. So I don't think anybody knows his name, but everybody knows his face. Everyone knows his face. And then uh the older the old I think he's German, so Eric von Donikin. Eric von Danica? Damn it! <laughs> oh no, this is gonna be so fun. <laughs> but yeah, so I actually we went to a, and watched them live. So, anyways, if you get a chance to contact in the desert, so fun. Who's your guy? Who's your guy that got you into all this? Graham Hancock. 
It's very familiar. Yeah, he wrote um, Fingerprint of the Gods, uh, Magician of the Gods. He's written so many books about, like, this topic and, like, ancient astronaut type stuff. Yeah. He's he's a... I'm a huge fan of his because he also tries to bring in physical evidence from the earth because he talks about like he also talks about like giants and the massive floods and he try and he ties it also back into the bible and biblical things too so he he, um actually talks about a lot of evidence out in the pacific northwest and i used to live out there and i took kristen on some hikes out there uh one time and so he talks about a lot of geological evidence to support the the like uh biblical flood that happens so i really love his work uh you can find him on quite a few different podcasts and some of his most popular ones that i know this joe rogan's can can be controversial um but he joe the one thing you have to give joe credit for is that he's a very good interviewer and uh, Graham Hancock and some of Graham's colleagues who are of the same mind and have built a lot of evidence around this this type of conversation, he has them on, like, Graham's been on his podcast, and I'll listen to anything Graham is on, um, <laughs> it, like, several times, like, four times or something. If you know the Mile Higher podcast, he was also on the Mile Higher podcast last year, and that's one of my favorite all-time favorite podcast um oh they do a great job over there i love kendall ray so much and her cousin i love all, everybody i love all of their podcasts they're <laughs> such a great group of people uh you can just feel that energy feel like i've never met them but you can just feel that about them <laughs> so he was recently on their podcast too and they were a little bit fangirly and i was like fangirly for them like <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, I love that. Also, it's, it's a fun world. It is. Also, a little side thing. Apologies in advance. Chris and I are both a little <laughs> sniffly, so excuse me a moment. Okay, <laughs> I am back from blowing my nose. I clipped it out. Everybody's good. The live that we're doing later. So apologies. Not so <laughs> They're not so lucky. <laughs> Just keep like ducking out of the fray. <laughs> I'll be muting my microphone a lot. So, all right, back on topic. All right. <laughs> so, our our comparison for SJM and her conspiracy theories is that she wrote the Asteri based on the Anunnaki. Yes, and the reason is so. Bobby said that they colonized. The Sumerians, um, there's a little bit of debate to that of like whether they came here and enslaved them or genetically created them. Um, obviously, we'll never know. Mm-hmm. So fight about it. Uh, <laughs> so the Anunnaki are described as humanoid, but not physical, but non-physical spirit beings that had the capability of phasing into any human form they chose. Much like the Asteri, just kind of picking their form. So the reason that the Asteri, or I'm sorry, the reason the Anunnaki came to Earth was because they came looking for certain minerals to mine from the Earth, specifically gold. The Anunnaki needed gold to patch up the atmosphere of their home planet and their home planet is either mineral depleted or mineral poor um obviously we don't really know Mm -hmm. but they are have a they're guessed to have gotten here through like stargates or wormholes Mm -hmm. and it feels to me like stargates and wormholes are very sci-fi terms so if I was a fantasy writer, I may have changed that to, like, portals or rifts. Mm-hmm. Right? And so the Anunnaki are also, uh, they also claimed that they created humans by taking the DNA of a male primate and mixing it with the DNA of a female Anunnaki. 
to create humans because they already had a species prior to humans that staged like a coup and a rise up against the slavery of the Anunnaki. Did I phrase that correctly? Does that make sense? It does make sense. Okay. So they replaced this stronger species with less strong humans that would not be able to rise up and overtake them. Mm-hmm. So, Bobby, light us up with all of your Crescent City. I love that you just said light us up because light it up, right? Okay. So, <laughs> also, I have fallen so much more in love with Crescent City on my reread. I just want to crawl into my book and be part of Lunafian so bad. Um, all right, Jenny, you called you called me the other day, a while ago, not the other day, but you said somebody in the audiobook had a very interesting accent. <gasps> oh my gosh. Okay, so on my reread, I, I actually really listened to them because I had a lot going on and it was just easier to be in motion while I was, you know, trying to consume this stuff before this uh, Flame and Shadow comes out. Um, Cormac has a, like, very Scottish accent. And then, yeah. And then Baxian has a very British accent. And... I love those two so much. Like, <laughs> on my reread, like, I don't know. I was, re I'm really hoping Cormac is still alive because there's a theory that he has a word mark tattoo and he may have gotten out of there. But after listening to it and hearing that portion of the book again, I am just like, I don't know if he made it out of that. He's so cool. <laughs> I don't know if he made it out of that, though. Um, and he's also compromised because the Asteri know he's involved. So uh, I don't know where the f*** you'd go because how can you hide from the Asteri? In the final chapters of Crescent City, we learn that the Asteri feed on first and second light. And we also know that Midgard isn't the first planet that they have cannibalized for resources. It just happens to be the best environment to house everybody with all of these powers. And they mention that, or Regulus uh, mentions that when they found this planet and that it was like a good home for multiple different species they welcomed other people from other planets and like brought them in and some of them came willingly <laughs> we know and we learn at the end of crescent city 2 that the asteri had a home planet but that when bryce was searching for it regulus is like you're not going to find our home planet because even we have forgotten where it's at that's right. We know their planet has been cannibalized. It, it doesn't exist to them anymore. And we also know that they have more brothers and sisters that they like, they all like scattered throughout the cosmos and that they were like searching for each other at one point. But it's alluded that these six Asteri are the last living or conscious Asteri. They're trying to find a way because they're actually trapped on Midgard now because we learn in the same conversation that they got trapped here by Thea because Thea's people stole uh, the horn in speculation, the harp of the Dread Trove. Which I think the horn is the fourth I lost item of the Dread Trove. And it has locked them into Midgard. And so they've been, for 15,000 years, they've been trapped on Midgard. And they've been trying to open the rifts again because they want more power. They want to eat more because we know that the first light and the second light is being pumped into them. And they're being fed that power. And the Autumn King talks about how power is depleting in the bloodlines. 
So Midgard is slowly losing their Midgardians are slowly losing their their power, which is the first light and the second light. Um, I have a theory that it's actually like people's souls, right? So there's a lot of conver. Yeah, there's because like your soul is what passes on and moves on. So I think that this power is that they're actually just consuming souls and. During Starfall, Rhysian explains to Feyre that there's less and less of these stars that they even mention are souls passing through, and he doesn't know why there's, they're, they're not traveling as far. So I think that the, you know, and we know that the Asteri's motive at the end is to get Bryce to open up the rift and find the, her home planet using her star on her chest, the beacon, to find that stay power that, and lead them back to that land that's rich in magic because they want to consume that magic. They want to start, you know, eating that because they know Midgard is is starting to be a problem for them. I had totally forgot about that with Reese and, and Feyre talking about the fewer stars. Mm -hmm. um, I just needed a moment of silence to contemplate that yeah <laughs> yeah um and it makes it kind of creepy that like they get slapped in the face by these souls <laughs> it's yeah funny. a lot about reese and Feyre is kind of creepy but that's okay <laughs> as cute of a couple they are they're very cringy <laughs> i wouldn't disagree with that <laughs> If you want to see more content like this, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe, and click the bell to be notified every time we upload. It really helps us out. Okay, so back to the Asteri. You mentioned that there's multiple in the universe. They sp or they spread out, but we know of six. One of them's dead. That made the magic seven. Um, so the Anunnaki, there was actually eight. Eight kings or gods or astronauts so it's super close to the seven hysteria again sarah j mass has like no responsibility to follow the rules right or to have the exact same number you know what i mean yeah so i think i think it's very similar i think it's similar enough yes to be like i think i think she's an ancient aliens fan I bet I bet in her free time she's binging ancient aliens. <laughs> I would probably think I think the same thing. Like, um and I think the seven fits better for her motives about the Greek mythology and stuff because like there's something about and this is actually in that post that I mentioned earlier of the map. So for the exact specifics, go ahead and, and read that. But and Greece, there is the land of seven hills, and that is mm. Greece. And so the numbers work better for her to take this idea and mush it together with the um, the like mythology portion that she's also bringing in with all of the names and the connections and all of that spider web of chaos. Um, <laughs> that she's doing, and I mean, she's doing a lovely job. We all know that, like, she wouldn't have a fandom if she wasn't tying it together. But the other crazy right. thing is that the first place that the Anunnaki and the Sumerians and that general region is the same region that MAP is incorporating. And the concentration of information around the Anunnaki is around the Mediterranean Sea, which includes places like, you know, Syria, Iraq, uh, Egypt, Greece, Croatia, and Italy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as we mentioned, the Anunnaki are believed to have created humans by mixing mm -hmm. primates and themselves. So a mix of terrestrial and non-terrestrial. Mm -hmm. Throughout history, and this is actually fairly prevalent in Greek and Egyptian mythology as well, and that is the idea of star children. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar in any capacity? I don't Maybe know. Maybe a little bit. Maybe a little bit. <laughs> Starborn. What? Ah. Huh. Weird. Uh, 
Stereo masking. Um, so if you're more interested, that'll be not necessarily linked, but all of our sources will be below. <laughs> so the Ancient Aliens season seven episode three is all about star children. And as soon as this one came up, I think I had to call Bobby and be like, "You are never gonna believe this." <laughs> It's literally children that are so much smarter, so much better, have supernatural abilities, everything, and people think that it is that alien DNA. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is so oh. much like the Starborn Fae, uh, <laughs> because they are believed to be blessed with mighty and special powers. And that historically, the bloodlines of the starborn powers were um, intermated to maintain the starborn line. Intermated is such a cute word for incest. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> I was also trying to stick with the terminology of mates because Faye. <laughs> but I think even more curious, like to your point earlier of Val using a mortal uh, woman would fall pregnant with the with a star god, the Anunnaki. Um, and she would have been of a, like a powerful, noble, mortal family house. I think this is super curious because of Bryce's lineage. Bryce, who has a mortal mother, a human mother, and is the strongest starborn fae of her time. Even before she took the drop, her starborn powers were so bright and strong. And we know that because how she saved herself and Danica against the um, asshole shifters. They're called something else, but I'm just calling them the asshole shifters who were stealing <laughs> animals. And I have a strong belief that Project Dusk was about the breeding power of the descendants of the missing Dusk Corps in Akatar to regenerate power on Midgard. And now that I've finished the second book, also to get a starborn Fae that had a strong enough beacon to find that other land for the Asteri to go back to and, and fight and consume again. The Autumn King complains at one point about how the Fae on their planet are growing weaker. And it would be in the best interest of the Asteri to, to breed this power into their world just so they can consume it. And we also know that the, that the Autumn King seems to know a lot about the Asteri and their projects. Because he alludes to this when he visits Bryce in the Fae archives and says he too is looking for the truth dusk truth i think he was asked by the asteri to breed with em ember quinlan and the reason i think this is because why else would the autumn king risk his position with the fey who seem to hate humans mm -hmm. i think he knew the project was called dust truth and that is why he used a specific word with Bryce and why we hear it so much in part three, the pit of, of CC2. And I also think that I know there's a couple of people who have done some like lineage lines and I'll try and post the one down below. I think Ember Quinlan is a descendant of humans from Prithian and might even be like a cousin to the mother of the Archeron sisters somehow. I know that. Um, I don't accept that. You don't accept that? <laughs> <laughs> Decided that's that's too much. Nope. You pushed me past the limit. <laughs> I don't know. You could get deep into that. And I'll link some of the posts about the lineages. Because there's other people who have done so much more research on that than I have. But I, I am curious that I'm keeping an open mind about that pathway. But we know that the Asteri have a bloodhound who is their loyal servant. So he very well could have sniffed out like some special thing about Ember and and the Autumn King and said, like, if you match these people, like, you could 
possibly get really strong power because I can smell their bloodline and there's a lot of power even though she's human her blood has the scent of power or something I don't know right we can also assume that Bryce is Dusk as yeah. Dusk is always capitalized and more specifically she smells like Dusk when Hunt goes to see her for the second time at the gallery he says that he can smell her like nutmeg scent and then something else and that something else is like the the gleam of the first stars before nightfall which is dusk i forgot she smelled like nutmeg did you know if you have too much nutmeg it'll kill you i did not know that <laughs> Yeah, so you have to be careful around Christmas time when you're making eggnog and sprinkling some nutmeg on it, because uh, it could kill you. Good to know. <laughs> Too much Bryce will kill you. <laughs> Too much. Yeah, well, the Oracle did warn Hunt to stay away from her. That is, that is in and of itself the most beautiful Easter egg. I don't know if that's the correct term, but like, you know. Yeah, oh, devil and spike that you think is just so cute. Um, Tasty. No. <laughs> Tasty. It's very similar to how Thera describes, like, Rhysand. He smells like la lavender and jasmine, but, like, night. She always explains that he kind of smells like darkness and night in, in twinkling stars or whatever. Um, so I think Bryce Adelaide Quinlan is the missing high lady of the Dust Court. I don't think she's going to stay in Prithian at all, but I do think that she is a missing high lady or next in line to have been the high lady of the Dust Court. Would you stay? I go back to Hunt, wherever Hunt is. Well, yeah, but I mean, like, at some point, all the worlds have to come together so they can have their intergalactic war. But, like, between the Crescent City and Prithian... Lunathonian. I don't know how to say that word. I always said Lunathian. Um, Lunathian. I, I don't know. I really like the mix of the old and the new in Lunathian. Um, yeah. I, I feel like I connect really well with that, like mashup, like this modern fantasy. Like I think I would probably go back, but and we know that the dusk room at the end of the at the end of Crescent City 2 shows worlds conquered, but I still think that Project Dusk is different than the Dusk Room because the other days were midday, midnight, and one other one. But I think the projects are different than the rooms themselves. And I think I still think that the, the Project Dusk or Dusk, Dusk Truth is about breeding to get back to the other land and to breed more power into the Fey lines. I want to talk about Project Thur really quick, too. Yeah. Um, because Regulus mentions it was the last time a group of people got as close to the truth as Danica, and it did not end well for them. This could be how, like, Hunt's dad dies, and that would explain a lot because it is, you know... We know that Hunt was bred to have a closer affinity um, to demons so he could hunt them. I think Project Thur was his, his breeding, and I believe that Hunt is actually a demigod or a reincarnated god. I'm not so sure yet on, the, on that, but if his mother truly is like that angel woman that is mentioned as his mother... I feel like he might be a demigod because she didn't have a lot of special powers. She was technically a low-born angel. So we've now talked about the Anunnaki, their breeding programs to create humans, their offspring of the star children that are speckled throughout history and very popular in Greek mythology, which, which Sarah J. Mass loves to, loves to pull from. With all of this, we have a lot of genetic manipulation and mixing of species. And there have been a few mutations, really for lack of a better term, I think mutations, um, 
And they're actually still present in humans today. What is that, 5,000 years after the Sumerians? Yeah. And that is RH, the RH blood type, RH positive, RH negative. RH negative. And a lot of people claim that that is alien DNA. So we all know there's four blood types of A, B, AB, and O. Well, I guess there's six because A positive, A negative. I actually don't know blood types. You let us know. (laughs) (laughs) However, um, about 15% of the population have the RH negative blood type. Mm -hmm. Um, And where this gets super interesting and incredibly tragic is that if a mother is RH negative and the baby is RH positive, the mother's body will actually attack the baby as if the mother and baby are two different species. Um, and so that's where a lot of people are like, see, alien DNA. Um, and we're actually going to link the article. There's an article below that's, um, the title is literally RH negative DNA does not mean you are descended from aliens. Um, but I'm going to be honest with you. Um, that's a little bit of a fun sucker. And there is just no space in this episode for facts. Or reality. This is a fantasy podcast. So <laughs> you can check it out, but I'm not going to talk about it anymore. <laughs> and this <laughs> this reminds me so much of the angels. Because in Crescent City 2, we learned that people, there was a people that came before the angels and that they ended up siding with the Fae and rebelling against the Asteri. And these people sound so much like the Illyrian warriors in Prithian. And we know that the Illyrians are a type of fae, but different. Um, And that they were bred and made to protect something. So they went back to the drawing board and they created angels and archangels. We have an outlier in the angels, though, with Orion Hunt Athlar. And we know that he was bred to hunt demons. And there are a lot of speculations around his lineage. But... Most agree that he is a descendant of Thur, or and I'm probably going to murder this an Analius. <laughs> and some of them believe that they are one in the same. Analius, Analius, guys, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> is the Illyrian warrior who drew the line in the in the arch that at the gates or at the at the top of Romuel. Um, and that arch reminds me of the gates in Crescent City. Um, and he held off the hordes of the enemies from reaching the top of Ramuel. He is believed to be dead due to language used by the by Prince Adius in his conversation with Jessica Roga at the end of Crescent City One, and um, uh, and she apparently knew him best. It would be so crazy to think that they they like she knew him. And that um, they were either, like, related, knew each other, maybe were lovers um, in a past life. Um, And she's supposed to be, like, a super crazy power old sorceress, right? Like, we don't know anything about Jessica. You know what I think? A little little off topic here. What if there was, like, a huge plot twist that Hunt was placed with an adoptive lowborn parent and Jessica is his actual mom. I know that's super unhinged. Um, and it doesn't explain his, his wings. Um, but I always wondered why Jessica never, ever mentioned Bryce letting him into the to the library, into the gallery. Like, she never, ever mentioned. She always bitched about Danica, but she never said anything about Hunt. I mean, I know. That- In fairness, though, she did know Danica was snooping. And Hunt was not a snooper. Yeah, he was just researching. And I also think Jespa has so... She meddles like um, Aelin so much. <laughs> Meddling ass bitch. But um, I wouldn't be surprised, though, if some of this is like reincarnation or something, too. Because that's like super prevalent in, in mythology as well. But, um, you know, this whole like RH negative bloodline being used to develop a new people a new species to to do the Asteri's bidding is so freaking similar to the Anunnaki um yes creating these other beings to do their bidding as well 
Yeah. So I firmly believe that Sarah J. Mass, with no proof whatsoever, other than reading Crescent City, right? This is just some random guesses from somebody that doesn't know anything. I think she's a huge Ancient Alien fan, and if not a fan of the show, definitely a fan of these theories. But if you go through, and I'm not recommending this to anybody, if you go through and watch Ancient Aliens, they're going to be like, whoa, that relates back to Crescent City. Whoa, I've heard that in Crescent City. Whoa, that's awfully similar. I mean, I know people are going to be super upset about this <laughs> uh, because people have very very strong about ancient aliens and yeah. how much they hate it yeah uh listen if you if you have watched ancient aliens and then changed the way you live your life based on that show just get in the lake you silly goose like <laughs> go cool off <laughs> <laughs> look there is so much so much used for the these plot and i think this is like the underlying long plot I think all the names and everything are come from Greek mythology, come from, and there's a lot of biblical elements in here too. She talks about hell. Um, there's a lot of references back to different things that happen in the Bible and different abilities of thing of, of people in um, the Bible as well. So this is a very much like angels and demons fighting, right? And so, which is the whole Bible. So all of this is so intertwined and connected, and I truly do think that she drew inspiration from from the Anunnaki, Star Children, RH negative bloodline theories, and all of these other conspiracy theories, and then threw in this mythology and these biblical terms to create this beautiful massiverse that we are all psychotic about. Yo, welcome to the masochist. <laughs> I mean, I just would imagine that she sees or, like, hears new information and then just, like, immediately is, like, boom, eight novel series. I could write about that mythology or that idea or, like, you know, I don't think she, I don't know her beliefs, but I, I just think she hears or sees something and is, like, that's very interesting. I could write an a eight novel series about that. Boom. Done. Yep. Yeah, I'm excited to see what we get out of Crescent City 3 uh, and yes. how if there's anything else in there that's going to support this or, or, you know, perpetuate these thoughts. Um, you know, one more Asteri shows up, that makes eight. It does. If there's one that appears anywhere else. Yo, you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> so, we are going to jump on a live so that live will have already been up and posted uh because we always they always save and post so that live is all about uh what we want to see from crescent city three and i have some thoughts and theories that didn't really fit into this episode quite as well or didn't stay on topic as much that i will be mentioning over there just some things i want to know some facts i want to point out that I think are going to play a really big part in Crescent City 3. So go over there um, and watch that video and put your comments in there about any of your thoughts of what you want to see out of Crescent City. Or if you've already read Crescent City by the time you watch it, go and say that I really wanted this to happen and we, we got this instead. So be sure to like, subscribe, turn on the notification bell so you know every time that we post and upload a new video. We are so, so, so grateful to have you here listening. And until next time, keep reading. <laughs>